session is about the programmatic and how it revolutionizes the way that we trade on digital advertising. Uh, sort of give you a summary of what we're going to see. We have a bunch of presentations to begin with. Uh, it's going to be a bit of research around programmatic, specifically for the Central Southeastern Europe uh, region. Then we're going to move on to discuss a bit more about data, which is intrinsically connected to the notion of programmatic. And then we're going to have quite an interesting panel uh, with participants from all of the constituents of the digital advertising ecosystem discussing what they see as challenges and opportunities within that new uh, space. Uh, without any further ado, let me introduce Mr. Farsa Dabesboy from Atlantis. Hi guys, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Elias Gagas, I'm from Daywin. Uh, we will be discussing, to begin with, as I mentioned, a bit of a research that we jointly did uh, during the last couple of months across the region. Uh, and before initiating the discussion of the actual results, let me quickly give a brief introduction of who we are and what we do. And Fats, you can get started on that front. Of course. Of course. So, um, a lot of you might be familiar with that nexus, or at least her name, but just to give you a quick overview. We are probably the largest independent uh, platform in terms of providing technological uh, infrastructure for a lot of the display advertising and online digital advertising companies within our ecosystem. I mean, there's a few very impressive stats up there that you can see. Uh, 80 billion impressions a day that we see if we process 40 terabytes of data, um, which, as you can imagine, gives us a sort of insights and knowledge to be able to make very, very wise and quick decisions, which benefit all of our clients. Um, and Tailwind? We are Tailwind, and we usually define ourselves as advertising technology in the great trust consultants. And we usually say that we bring two things, uh, at least in our hands. On one end, a set of available technologies. One of our value partners is at Nexus on that front for the realm of programmatic. And on the other end, we bring people who discuss with our clients, understand their needs, identify what is the correct mix of technologies that they can use uh, to reach and exceed their goals, and then make sure that these technologies deliver on the purpose. Uh, and this is actually one of the interesting findings that we will see during the course of the research site. Sort of an idea regarding what the research was. Uh, this has been quite a substantial project, being run both by Tailwind and by Nexus. Uh, Nexus has been taking care of the research across the Western Europe markets, and Tailwind has been taking care of the research on the markets where we operate, which is essentially Central, Southeastern Europe, Middle East, and Africa. What we're going to see today is the results of that research as far as buyers and sellers of advertising space are concerned for the specific region of Central Southeastern Europe. And we're going to see quite an interesting comparison between how this region seems to think about programmatic versus what we have been seeing from the research that Nexus has conducted in Western Europe. And without any further delay, let me jump in to a couple of stats. And let me sort of preamble that by mentioning the following thing. We're going to show you a bunch of numbers. Uh, those numbers mean a lot and nothing at the same time. Obviously, numbers are translated according to the perception and the actual discussions that we have been having with all of you during the last months, the last years. And this is what we're going to try to do during the panel session, sort of dissect through this data and identify exactly what they mean. But as far as pure data are concerned, for the buyers of advertising space, so this would be your agency or your advertiser, we're seeing that as far as the understanding of what programmatic is, we're getting a good amount of people answering that they have a fair understanding of programmatic. Obviously, this is open to you know, uh, debate on exactly what it means. We have a smaller percentage, a bit over 10%, saying that they have an excellent understanding of programmatic, and quite a substantial number either having limited knowledge or some of them never heard of programmatic. As far as how many of the advertisers are using, actively using programmatic right now to buy advertising space, we have more or less half of them saying that this is something that they use. This is something that is part of their daily routine. Do they use it for performance? Do they use it for brand campaigns? Do they use it for both? We're getting sort of a mixed response there. So we have 30% saying that it's purely performance. 
10% purely brand, and the majority of them say that they use it both for branding as well as performance uh, campaigns. And what is quite interesting is when we discuss with them what are the issues that they face, so what are the potential problems that they have. We get a good percentage quoting complex implementation, and I'm going to sort of preempt a couple of slides ahead, but this is something that we will see on the seller side as well. Lack of inventory, and even more so, 33%, lack of what they quote premium inventory, and I'm sort of going to introduce here our own experience, because we have been discussing with a lot of you. When we say premium inventory over here, it usually means local, properly branded, and properly targeted inventory. And finally, there are a couple of people saying, no issue at all, everything is okay, fast. How does it look compared to Western Europe? So this is really interesting. What I want you to sort of focus most on is the similarities in what we're going to discuss. So as Elias mentioned, you know, the complexities is something you're going to hear more and more of. The lack of premium inventory is also something that is, it is something that's going to come up on the sell side as well. So as you can see, look at the different sort of numbers here. You probably expected Western Europe to be a lot higher than the market in terms of the understanding and the adoption of uh, programmatic. But as you can see, based on the sample base that we had, we had a lot of people in CSEE saying that they actually understand, that they understand programmatic, they get it. But the problem is, if you notice the sort of bar at the bottom, if, you, if they get it, then why, why is it not being adopted as much? Is it because of reliances on the supply side? I mean, we'll go into that later on. And if, as you can see on the, on the right side, you've got Western Europe where, you know, we do get it, it is activated, it's something that we execute on, you know, day in, day out. So you can see the usage is a lot higher. But in terms of you know, what the feedback was, was that people are like, well, I, I sort of get it. You know, there, there is a little bit more that I could probably improve on. Is that based on, is there too much information? Is it moving quicker on that side than it is on this side? So it's harder to keep up. Uh, we'll, we'll go into that. OK, so let's take a look at the other end of the, of the spectrum. And let's take a look at the sellers, so the publishers, the ad networks out there selling uh, advertising space through programmatic. As far as the understanding is concerned, we have sort of a similar approach. We didn't get any, you know, I never heard of it uh, as answers over here, but we have a fair majority saying that they have a fair understanding of it, uh, but there is a substantial number, over 15%, which says that they have a limited knowledge of what it is and how it performs. As far as adoption, uh, we're really lagging behind. I mean, it's in the order of 25% of the publishers saying that programmatic is something that they actively uh, use on a daily basis. And one of the key interesting points on the publisher side of things is how they expose the inventory uh, within the programmatic uh, realm. And what we're seeing over here is that predominantly, the majority of it, 50%, they're actually exposing it on a blind basis. Uh, you have a couple of them utilizing categories. And to be perfectly honest, a surprising uh, percentage saying that they actually utilize, actively utilize data collection and the creation of audiences to expose their inventory. As far as the issues that the publishers are facing, we're seeing sort of a similar approach to what we saw on the buyer side of things. Uh, that is, there's still an issue with the complexity of the implementation. How do you get it within your organization, make sure that it works and that it functions according to what you want? 50% says that there's not enough demand, and this is one of the paradoxes that we need to, to discuss uh, moving ahead, because as we saw, the buyers seem to be using it much more than the sellers are. And then there is the issue of uh, controlling, controlling who is displayed through the programmatic pipe, which is a more automated mechanism, and you have a lot less time to react to what is appearing on your side. And then we also have uh, a small percentage saying that there is no issue with it. And I guess the comparison with Western Europe fast is more or less similar. Yeah, I think, I think those are some really good points. I think the complexities just came up again. The lack of premium you know, inventory sort of ties in with what Ellis was mentioning around the blind inventory. You know, it just doesn't go together like that. So you can see the comparison here again. A great understanding from a publisher perspective, but look at the bar at the bottom. It's tiny. It's not being executed on. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a shame, to be honest with you. And on the right side, you can see not as high of an understanding, but from a sell side in Western Europe, this is something that is just a part of their process, is a part of the business models that's out there. So I think the key thing, Elias, I mean, I'm not sure if this is something you know, but is it, is it a marketing issue? Is it something that, you know, the demand side, it's there, but the publishers are saying it's not. So is it a communication issue? Is it a marketing issue? It's something worth thinking about. I think it's a 
think there are several aspects at play here, and obviously we will discuss them during the, the panel. And it's sort of an interesting uh, intro to the next slide. It's a bit convoluted, but let me sort of explain what lies behind those pretty lines. Uh, what we're essentially seeing is that when we ask the sellers of inventory what percentage of your revenue comes from programmatic, by and large, 35.7% quote something like 1.5, one between 1 and 5% of the revenue coming in. If you include the lower uh, tier, you essentially have something like 50% making just a minuscule amount out of programmatic. On the other end, when we ask the buyers, uh, how much do you use programmatic? What is the percentage of the advertising budget that you actually spend on programmatic? We have a couple of interesting finds here, because number one, we're getting a bit of higher percentages on the higher tiers, but at the same time, and this was actually unique to the Central Southeastern Europe market, we didn't have the same re results in Middle East, we have a substantial amount not disclosing that information or saying that they don't know the answer to it. And to some extent, fast, this might be one of the issues, uh, because if there's no transparency between the two sides of what is the amount that is actually actively being traded out there, uh, it's a hard sell on the seller side to actually invest and promote and start utilizing programmatic. They need to be aware of what are the potential benefits that need to be gained. And our next session is our chance to play ping pong uh, and to sort of uh, be perfectly honest, we rehearsed that uh, presentation uh, a week or so ago in Dubai because we made the similar presentation regarding the Middle Eastern research. So this is where I'm playing buyer and you're playing seller, so let's switch okay. sides. Okay, let's, let's do this properly. Yeah. Okay, otherwise it's gonna get confusing. All right. So, so I'm a buyer, and you know, half of the buyers say that they actually use programmatic. So we're spending them. out there. Half of them, so ideally we should see the same thing on the sell side, right? I and mean, we should see half of it, but see that disconnect. There's only, there's only a quarter of them. So there's, once again, a lack of communication. There's some sort of disconnect that needs to be addressed. First, we need premium content. I mean, we, we need to be able to identify who we're buying from and where we're going to be premium, appearing. Premium content. I like selling blind, Elias. I mean, that's, that's how I've always done it. This is the way that the industry is, isn't it? I mean, how, how do you want me to give you a premium inventory? I'd rather sell my inventory as blind, if I'm honest. Well, let's, let's try to figure out a way to travel, you know, to the middle of the path over there. And I think one thing that we both agree is that it's a complex thing, right? Oh, God. Don't get me started on that. It's so complicated, isn't it? It actually is, to be perfectly honest. There must uh, be an easy way. And, and, and part of the two-day session that we have here, because today we have this lovely session, tomorrow we have an additional uh, keynote session on stage one, which all of you should attend. And we also have a workshop where we're gonna go in a bit of a more detailed approach, is to educate the market, is to show you exactly what lies behind those uh, terms, uh, those three-letter acronyms that we purposely avoided to, to use. So we, we didn't talk about DSPs or SSPs or DMPs or nothing of the sort over here, but we know that when we discuss things with you, these things come up as part of the discussion. So to cut things short, because we have an additional presentation and then we have a, a speed panel uh, to run, these are some of the findings or some of the ideas that we have after running this research and based on the combined experience that we have from talking with all of you. Number one, it's quite evident, programmatic adoption lags behind what we see in Western Europe. This comes as no surprise, pretty much we knew that, but it's good to, to actually corroborate that with the actual findings of the, of the research. Number two, education, additional information, explanation of what it is and how it works seems to be essential. Uh, it's something that we see both in the adoption and the understanding rates as well as do the statement that complexity is an issue on both fronts. The stage is set for yet another term, which is programmatic premium, which essentially means utilizing programmatic, utilizing the technology capabilities to actually start to facilitate one-to-one -one relationships. Travel that road and meet in the middle. Be able to buy properly branded inventory from the buyers and be able to pay them what they need to be paid for that proposition. And finally, and this comes from our experience, but it's up to debate and it's something that we will discuss during the panel. We firmly believe that 2014 seems to be sort of a year of, you know, properly structuring, understanding, making the key decisions. Uh, but our experience thus far indicates that all of the players, 
especially the buyers, move towards having programmatic as a key component of their strategy beginning uh, with 2015. That being said, this concludes sort of the brief presentation of the research uh, findings. Feel free to go and register uh, for a copy of the full report, which includes a lot more information, not only on programmatic, but across several uh, dimensions, uh, touching both upon buyers as well as sellers. And without any further delays, let me give the mic and the clicker to Gregors from Nagat. Uh, he will give you a presentation on data. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Grzegorz Słowatyński and I'm cooperating with Nagat Company. Before I start, a few words about Nagat. So we are the largest, the biggest European platform in Europe. We, have, we are cooperating in most of the, not only CE markets, but also in all markets all around the Europe. Since 2010, we are part of uh, Deutsche Post. Okay. What do we need for a successful programmatic or RTB campaign? Let's, I will show you one example. Let's say we get an advertiser. Advertiser is a producer of cat food. He said, okay, feed your cat with this food, your cat will be happy, he will be living for 20 years, and he will scratch your sofa. Okay, ad form, which we have, let's say it's interstitial with video, with music, with everything what we can imagine. Let's say we are running this campaign in RTB platform. So we have won in one of the biggest, let's say, Romanian portal, we have won the auction. So we have paid, let's say, 10 euro cents CPM for our campaign, interstitial video, music, and all we can imagine. So. Let's look from the other side of this. I am the user who opened this portal and I see this interstitial with video where I see the cute cat and things like that, but I have an allergy on the cats. So probably I will never be interested in such a things. So generally what we need is not only to buy ads as cheap as possible, but we also need to target our ads into proper target group. So here, probably, if we, sell, uh, if we buy this uh, campaign in uh, 10 euro cents in CPM, someone could say, okay, it's success. But from the other hand, when we miss the target group, it's a media waste. Okay, so optimizing campaigns. What do we need for that? Generally, what do we need for, for collecting data? Generally, we need some system. Nagat is one of this uh, system which allows you to collect data. The main thing is that this is real time system. We are collecting data all the time. We are collecting all data about all available users. What is interesting in Nagat technology is that we are using predictions. This is a unique thing which allows us to identify all the users in a network we are cooperating with, regardless of the channels or, or things like that. So, as you can see, 70 data, minimum 70 data per uh, points per user, live classification, so one user who is, for example, categorized like a guy who is interested in cars, okay, today he can be a guy, but after he have bought a car, for example, he's not more interesting in buying a new car. So our algorithms are analyzing uh, his behavior and the networks on the website and updating his profile all the time. What data are available? Generally, the most, uh, the, the most popular data are demographic data. So you can target your uh, your adds into on, on the age, gender, uh, a, a level of education, and things like that. 
general product interests like care, interest in cars, electronics, and etc. Also, more detailed data like uh, con consumer behavior or purchase intentions. We can find the users who, for example, are looking for a laptop Acer model LM2051. Of course, target group will be very small, but we can also catch these uh, this, this users in all the network. So, in Romania market, we have also available data because Nagat is not a self-running uh, system. We need some publishers to, to collect the data. In Romanian market, we have some data in other sea countries. We have also uh, data available which we can deliver. Okay, where we can deliver data? Generally, it is very easy. It's very easy to deliver data to any ad server, to any SSP, DSP platform. I will not get deep into this, uh, these integrations, but generally you can do it integration based on pixel. So you send me a pixel, I put this pixel in, uh, in the, my server, and I'm sending you information about target group. It's very easy, and it takes three hours to, to run your campaign. Another solution is server to server. With server-to-server -server integration, we need more time to integrate each system, but you have your data available all the time without sending any, any, any pixels. Okay, what kind of data should we use and where should we use this data? It depends on the campaign KPI. We will use different data for branding campaigns and different data for direct response. For example, for direct response campaigns, we will use purchase intentions. This number of this data is much smaller than, for example, uh, gender or, or age data. Okay. At the end, I would like to show you what proportion it was measurement made in Western Europe. How does it look like how, the, how users use the data? So, as you can see, not only First, data, first party data, but also third party data is being hardly used in uh, all markets uh, in, in Western uh, Europe. And the last, security. Because it's it's very hot topic uh, on all markets, European Union's markets, because data, uh, data sometimes may be... Uh, question is, are we breaking privacy with selling information to some platform or something like this? Discussion is uh, from a couple of years and still everybody are, are, are looking for the answer, but with Nagat technology, it's every time safe. We are the first company in the Europe which have European certificates that says that we do not break any privacy and all the data in our system are safe. So, thank you for your attention. Okay, so we have something like an hour left. I would like to invite our panelists to join us on the stage. First come, first serve on the seat arrangement, guys. I know that you have, might have preferences. Good to go? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, so, you know my name, you know Gregor's name, but let's do a quick run through throughout the, the panels. Name, company, exactly what you're doing to sort of get an understanding of where you stand in the overall ecosystem, and then we'll dive deeper <coughs> into the actual discussion. Start with me? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Casper. I'm CEO of Zaxis EMEA. So for us, EMEA includes uh, the Central Eastern European um, uh, region. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about Zaxis, we're part of uh, WPP, 
Uh, we work very closely with the four group and media agencies, uh, so Mediacom, Maxis, MEC, and Mindshare. Um, and our remit within the business is to, um, is to work with data and technology to help our um, agencies and their clients engage and reach audiences. Um, so, you know, we have our own DMP, um, we build our own technology um, and, um, uh, and employ about 800 people who are specialists in that field. So it's a very specialist capability and function within, uh, within, within WPP. Just to give you a sense of the scale, we're about uh, $800 million business and about half of that is Europe. Um, so we're not a sort of small business in Europe, we're actually quite a large scale business here as well. <laughs> That'd be reasonable. Um, hi, my name is Nigel Gilbert. I'm a vice president with AppNexus uh, across EMEA as well. For the sake of saving time, we consider the region in very much the same way Casper does. Um, I've been with the business now for nearly three years. For those that don't know, AppNexus is an infrastructure provider in the world of programmatic. We provide buy-side technology, sell-side technology, and uh, an open API infrastructure, so you can customize the platform in any way you want. Um, I'll give you an idea of scale for us. Um, we're based in New York, 600 or so employees. Uh, we manage something like a third, maybe a little bit more, of all RTB transactions globally. Um, something like a billion uh, transactions per day. All right. Wow. So, okay, it works. That was a real show off. Great. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Sasha, Sasha Berlig. I'm running the European Operation of Data Zoo. And uh, we are one of the leader, leading global um, programmatic marketing platforms. We are a technology pure play, um, including a demand side platform, data management platform, and having a very, very great and big analytical stack. Um, in Europe, we have roughly 60 people on the ground. We are on the Romanian market since two years. And yeah, we are out of the MIT in Boston, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And we are not a former ad tech company. We're 100% big data analytics. Thank you. Um, so my name is Attila Barta. I'm, uh, I'm heading the Kedrian team in, in Hungary. Which operates actually as a hub for the CE region. Uh, Kirgan is the trading desk solution for uh, Inter Public Group. Um, so it's a global uh, company. We have offices across uh, across the globe, from, from the US to Australia, and we just very recently brought it to uh, to the region. Um, so basically, the idea is that the campaign management team sits in Budapest, and uh, we have local representation in, in all markets, including um, Romania as well. So. In terms of the scale, um, this operation probably is smaller than what you guys have uh, in London, for example. Um, but, but, but we are local, and that's that's what we are trying to do to represent the uh, advertisers and buyers in this programmatic space, which is it's just we learned this quite complicated. Excellent. So you know we have the combined knowledge and might of some pretty big companies and very interesting panelists. And let me kick it off by asking the very first question, which is the following. I mean, we saw a bit of research and we saw a bit of comparison between this region over here uh, and what Western Europe seems to be like. How does that coincide with your current view of the business? Uh, and let's take it the other way around, just to be fair and sort of continue the ping pong game that we initiated with us before. So, Attila. Yeah, so, so for us, um, we're trying to put the advertiser in the focus. So there, there were a couple of, uh, couple of challenges on the screen. Um, some of them we think it's valid, some doesn't really apply to us because, uh, like for instance, uh, we understand the frustration around uh, local um, publishers joining the programmatic space, but from an advertiser point of view, it's really about audience and the audiences on, on international sites as well. Um, but of course, there can be campaigns where uh, where the local content is really significant. So that's that's something we are looking at as well. I think what I've seen, I've seen that a couple of times before. I'm in the programmatic marketing space since 2008, and um, the picture we see here about Romania and that's in general about Eastern Europe is what I've seen in the south of Europe. Let's say one or one and a half years ago. And in Germany or in the UK, let's say three to four years ago, means publishers adapt slower than the advertising industry, the buyers. And this is nearly exactly the same as we have seen in Germany um, three years ago. 
means um, publishers want to secure their inventory. They first put, put um, only blind inventory into supply-side platforms or platforms like Maxis, for example. And the more they realize that they really can earn money and that advertisers are pushing for transparency, the more the publishers open their currently blind inventory, they start to work with private exchanges and so on and so on. Um, I think it's, it's now the task of the large agency groups and all the big advertisers to really push money into programmatic that publishers see that they lose their money if they don't open the inventory to programmatic marketing platforms. Um, we have seen that all over the world and it's just a matter of time. I, I'll give Romania six to 12 months to be on the same level as, um, yeah, I would say Germany and UK. Cool. Thank you very much. You have your own. Thanks for the plug as well, Sasha. I appreciate that. Um, so, look, I'll, I'll, I'll echo a lot of what Sasha said there. Um, I think that the, the market difference is probably one of the most, if not the most important things. You know, you, don't, you shouldn't just use programmatic because it looks interesting or because you've got some data, because you want to get performance, because you can do all of those things anyway. People use programmatic based on the conditions that their market find themselves in. So, let's take the UK. By far, they did the most lucrative programmatic market in Europe. Programmatic is something like 20 to 25 percent of all display in the UK right now. Um, that's significant, but that's the case because performance is a significant part of the UK market. And programmatic speaks to performance extremely well. It's by far the best way for an advertiser to use data. Obviously, you want to buy on an impression basis so there's no wastage. But if we don't adopt the opportunity for the seller at the same time, then it won't get beyond that. So it, it, it will stall. If you go to Germany, for example, they want something completely different. Those guys are looking for operational benefits. They're looking at things like um, API infrastructures to their business intelligence systems, and then finding a better way to do what they were doing before, not finding a way to do something new. So you guys have to ask yourselves, what's the driver here, right? Do you want to find better performance? Do you need to aggregate more reach? Um, do you need a more effective way of using data? Um, do you have a lot of wastage in the market? I mean, I'm, I'm going to try and learn those things while I'm here, you know, but, uh, but yeah, I think that's what we've seen elsewhere. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd sort of uh, say a quote, which I, I actually think it was Marissa Meyer who said this, which I, think, which I think was interesting, but, you know, the opposite of programmatic isn't premium, right? The opposite of programmatic is a fax machine, right? I think that's actually a really nice way of thinking about it. Um, you know, I, I sort of slightly disagree with Sasha's view that, you know, we should all have rallied together and try and push as much as possible into programmatic, otherwise we'll all get really upset and annoyed. Um, uh, you know, I think programmatic is, a, is, is one way of, uh, you know, f of, of, of engaging with publishers, right? It's not the only way of engaging with publishers. It's not necessarily right for every type of publisher. It's not necessarily right for every type of campaign. Um, and it comes back to the point that, you know, I, I don't know who saw my, my keynote just now, but we were talking about it there. You know, programmatic in technology isn't just changing the way we buy media. Right? It's, a change, it's changing the way that we do media. Right? And that's a big fundamental difference because it's, not, it, it's partly about finding new ways of engaging with publishers and new ways of buying from them, but it's actually, you know, there's a huge challenge for our industry to rethink the way that we structure our organizations, the way agencies are structured, the way the publishers are structured, the way we work with each other. Um, so it's much more fundamental than just sort of like trying to push people onto a, onto a, you know, to sell the imagery on a certain platform. I think it's a, it's a, it creates a whole new dialogue that's needed around data, around technology cooperation, um, around inventory, you know, and around people as well. Because I think what you'll find is actually your biggest bottleneck um, is the people. Um, the, 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 this, this, these technologies, these, these data opportunities, the, the, um, you know, the inventory strategies require fundamentally different skill sets than the ones that most agencies and publishers have today. Um, and, you know, even in sophisticated markets like UK, US and other places, you know, it is unbelievably difficult to find the people who can actually set this stuff up properly. The com competition is fierce. Everyone on stage here is trying to hire those people, as are most of the people who are sitting in the audience probably. And there's probably a small handful of people who get that in Romania. And it's going to be a while before that, sc that scales enough. So that's, a, that's the biggest challenge, I would say. From my point of view, I think uh, from the prismat of, of CE countries, because I'm, I'm stationary in Warsaw, but I'm visiting all the countries in CE Europe. And what is interesting is that every country is in different approach. So 
what is, for example, in Poland normal and what is uh, what, what people are doing. This is completely new, for example, in Serbia. So this is very interesting. We are living in one Europe, yes, and, and this uh, information exchange, these things which are in UK where four years ago, probably nowadays, they are in Poland, yeah? So this is this, uh, I don't know how to call it, but, but it needs some time, you know, every market needs some time to, 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 to get up. Uh, but uh, programmatic, uh, what people say uh, in the markets which, which this is new thing, yeah? They say that, okay, we are afraid of this. Okay, what about it will destroy totally this play, it will change everything. But, uh, but I think the case is of education, because if you go to these people and show them how it works, it do not kill your business, it's, it will improve your business. They start to try it, yes, and start to move on. Uh, from also from from Nugget point of view, yes. Yeah, so we are comparing, for example, German market to to, to Polish or CE market. Uh, we are in CE market one step back, yes. Yeah, so so what is nice in Germany in some countries, of course, yes. Um, Poland is is the leader uh, here, uh, but uh, but this is also some opportunity for us because this behavioral targeting, predictive behavioral targeting, we. Uh, we used uh, since 2007, yeah, because Nagat was founded in 2006. So first of all, we uh, we use this technology for display campaigns, yes, and and it's also changed, yes. So uh, also, what I can see that uh, that I'm trying to tell the publishers, okay, guys, give me some data, sell me this data, I will sell this data, and. Uh, I, I started to talk about this about one, one and a half year uh, ago in Poland and people said, no, I don't trust this, uh, what will happen, I do not have control of that. But if they try it, if they start to selling it, they see real money that they are coming to them, they become very happy. Okay, no, that's, uh, that's quite interesting and I guess one thing that uh, I also have to mention based on the research that, uh, that we run is that you know, the, the, the actual key characteristics of the region over here are, are quite intriguing. Uh, I mean, it's a bunch of countries connected by land, but essentially, you know, islands on the sea. Um, completely separated markets, uh, different languages, uh, different ideas, different needs, different characteristics. Uh, I mean, for example, we got quite an interesting difference between the, the answers that the Middle East market gave us. And I was thinking about it during the last couple of weeks, and I think one of the key reasons is that the, the Middle Eastern North African market, even though it seems you know, like a huge space of all those different countries, it sort of has a gluing factor behind it. I mean, there is Arabic as a gluing factor, and it's also a market predominantly being run from UAE, so Dubai is the hub for most of the action happening over there. So to some extent, you know, programmatic probably matured over there as, a, as an immediate need. This is what they had to do in order to facilitate the trading. Um, and this sort of leads me to the second round of questioning, and we will spice it up this time, so Sasha, you will take lead on that since you already have the mic, uh, which is the following. I mean, we, we've all you know, said uh, a bunch of things about our experiences. If we are to a bit more specifically quantify them or describe them as key challenges that we see uh, on either side of the ecosystem, what would be sort of your top pick for buyers and sellers as the key challenge that they need to face? And what would be sort of your idea based either on the experience that you have from the Western markets, which as you amply described before, are more or less a look in our future to some extent, of how they mitigated these challenges, how they came about to actually either bypass them or tear down the walls and make sure that programmatic was moving ahead. So what are your take on, on that? Yes, that's a great question. So I stand up. I think it will take something like two to three hours to answer that. Um, Five to ten minutes. <laughs> Five minutes. Okay. Um, I think if, if I'll um, first focus on the um, Eastern European markets, yeah, and not on the Middle East markets. By the way, I just had a keynote three weeks ago in Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia, um, just focusing on the Middle East market, where quite a lot of people from Dubai were there as well. And this is a quite developed market. I didn't expect it that developed as it is. Um, and the hub is, you're right, it's um, Dubai. But they have as well the publishing problem, the publisher's problem. So about um, Eastern Europe. 
I think one of the main challenges we have is the focus on really performance pricing currently. Um, it's a very low CPM and programmatic. It's um, cost per click focused. And I think it's about educating that programmatic marketing, as Casper said, um, is, doesn't mean the opposite of premium. Programmatic mar marketing is a holistic view on the user. It's a user-centric um, digital marketing approach. And you have to see that that way. And it's not about buying just performance media. I think that's one of the key challenges. It's educating the marketeer. It's educating the agencies or bringing the agencies to educate the brands what programmatic marketing really means. And I think Casper is here to educate the brands. And we are here as well. And on the other hand, it's talent. Um, what we see in the Romanian market, for example, and in the Polish market as well, compared to UK and Germany, is um, there isn't the same lack of talent as we have in the other parts of Germany, uh, in the other parts of Europe. And um, you have a huge, um, you have much, much more talent um, than I've seen in, for example, southern Germany and uh, southern Europe. I've seen in Germany, I've seen in the UK, and even seen in the US. So um, I don't really see that challenge, as you described it. And um, this is my first conference here in Romania. And all the chats I had here, um, you really have an in-depth understanding of what we're talking about. And I've never experienced that before in a country which is in that stage. So I think from the buyer's point of view, you're in the stage like the rest of Europe or the southern part of Europe and the northern part of Europe was in something like 2011, 2012. But the people I'm talking to have the knowledge of, yeah, 2014. Oh, thank you very much. I'm um, not sure sitting so between you two is a particularly sensible place to be. Well, keep, just, keep, keep in mind that you ready. chose your own seats, right? I didn't make any arrangements for it. I was trying to get this one. <laughs> So, um, okay, the, what do I see as the challenges in terms of where the growth can come from? Um, I, firstly, I, I do want to, to, to quickly pull up what, what, what Sasha was saying. In terms of the customers that we have, and we've been, we've been powering programmatic at AppNexa since you know, 2006, 2007, this region, we've got some of the most sophisticated companies um, on, our, on our platform. Um, I can think of a handful from here. I think digital, obviously, is, is a great example of that, um, who are particularly innovative. Um, and the innovation comes from the places you would least expect. The UK, while it's the biggest market, by some distance, is almost certainly the least innovative. We don't do anything particularly sophisticated. We've just got scale, right? Well, keep in mind that the innovation sometimes comes out of necessity. It's, it's, quite often it does, absolutely. Uh, the most innovative market, unfortunately, isn't here. It's probably the Netherlands. I'm sure everybody would, would agree with that. Sasha's probably not going to agree with that. She's no, looking at me. I think that's because of Right, so we have heritage there, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm biased. But our programmatic is 50% of that market today, 50%. Um, you know, that, that's significant. They're not afraid to take risks. Um, they understand there's a great relationship between the buyer and the seller. They know each other really well. Um, you know, they've, they've got a cookie law, which has forced them into this concept of necessity to try different things. So, you know, that's where you see a lot of innovation coming from. France is a culture full of engineers. Um, and I'm sure you guys will all agree the engineering uh, cultures that come from Central and Eastern Europe are some of the most advanced, uh, Tel Aviv in particular as well. So, you know, we're in the right part of the world. Um, in terms of then the challenge into how, how to actually scale that, how, how to grow that, I think the business model is, is still the problem. Uh, I mentioned earlier that people don't always have a great understanding of what they want to use this for, um, and I still completely agree with that. And I'm going to draw on the UK again as a, as a great example. I can name some very big companies in the UK that while they're trading heavily, in programmatic, they've got no real idea where that business is going to be in six months or 12 months. Uh, th th these are companies that would really surprise you. Very, very big names. They don't have enough visibility. They don't have enough understanding about their customers. They've got no mobile strategy still. You know, this is insane. You get to 2016, programmatic is going to be 50, 60% of that market, and these people don't know what they're doing. If they're not moving faster, there's a chance they could die. These are big companies. So I see regions like this, while you guys are slightly you know, trending behind, let's say, only in terms of market percentage, market share for programmatic, not in terms of understanding or capabilities. Everything's there as soon as you want it. So it's all there. Um, you, know, you guys can probably try to skip over those mistakes and go straight to uh, you know, the end games that unfortunately the UK's had to, had to find out the hard way. 
yeah, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think the challenges have been well outlined. I won't, I won't dwell on them. I, I, I sort of know the opportunity, and I agree with what Nadra said. I mean, I think you know, you, you, you have the advantage of seeing all the mistakes other people have made, um, and you know, just like the UK, frankly, and Germany and other places had the advantage of seeing the mistakes that the US made, you know, and learned from those mistakes, and have you know, arguably embraced the uh, the whole programmatic environment differently as a result, um, and I. I'm going to agree with Sasha, and, I, and he, he makes a good point. Um, you know, you do have amazing people here. It's very true. I mean, we still have to bring those people into into the advertising space because, it's, again, it's a very entrepreneurial, you know, technology-driven region in general. Um, and you know, we, we need to harness that capability into our businesses. So there's still competition for resource. I agree. It's it's it, there's there's a lot of them though, and it's a very you know it's a very um, high knowledge area for us as well. Um, but I would say that it's like you know the opportunity is to learn from where, where, from other people's challenges and to really you know push the market here into new places. You know whether that's a more of a mobile first strategy, um, you know just solving some of the problems that existed elsewhere. Yeah, uh, from my point of view, I will concentrate on Poland on that uh, because it's, it's the most advanced in, in that case. Uh, so I think education. Yes. Yeah, so so I agree with you in 100 percent because people do not understand what are we doing sometimes. Yes, and uh, Poland is is not maybe so much as two years ago, but uh, it's very concentrated uh, performance market. Yeah? So people are looking at this CTRs. Uh, okay, I got branding campaign, and uh, with your data, CTR was 0.1%. Without your data, 0.7, for example. Yeah, So people really do not understand uh, what they do sometimes. Yes, So education, uh, people, education agencies, yes, and agency goes to the direct clients and and Heavy clickers, yeah, it's, it's probably, I, I have somewhere in the measurement that 3% in Germany comes, 3% of, of, of heavy clickers generates 67% of, of all clicks, yeah, so, so this is real crazy. Uh, but another challenge for me on, on, on Polish market is value of data, because uh, people sometimes do not understand uh, what is the value of it, yes, what does it mean that I can provide you uh, people who are, who are looking uh, for a new car, who are going to change his car in next 12 months, uh, who have income uh, 5,000 euro, for example, plus. And uh, what I'm really afraid of uh, on, on Polish market, for example, is that that uh, some companies are trying to, to, to offer data in very low price. Yes, so uh, there is some good level, I think, right now, uh, which we are selling data, but uh, more companies appears, appears, and, and the price is going really low. So. I, I, I'm really afraid that suddenly it will cost, I don't know, 0.01 euro cent yes, per CPM. And, and I'm, I'm a little bit afraid not to destroy this market uh, before it's really uh, born to, to, to be alive and, and adult. Yes? So, so these are the main challenges for me. Yeah, um, I think Kijan represents the advertisers, so I will try to approach from their perspective. Um, and, and I think that's... So that's because we are heavily tied to what they do or what they don't do actually. So um, I'm I'm totally agree with with all of you guys here talking about the talent and the skill set that uh, programmatic requires, um, and it's one thing that uh, it requires special skill set in terms of uh, how the technology works and how it's how to set it up and how to operate it. But I think programmatic also requires a special knowledge in terms of strategic thinking, um, and that's what oftentimes is missing from, from the advertisers. So they don't really know what to do with digital. And, and, and it doesn't necessarily apply to programmatic. They don't know what to do with digital at all. So probably some, some of them um, perhaps run a, a digital campaign just to, just to maintain a certain share of voice online as well. But that's not the way to go. They, they, they don't know what to say to that specific audience. They don't know how to differentiate between these audience. They don't know how to engage with them online. They don't know what to uh, give them or offer them on, on, on the website. They don't know how to support uh, their sales mechanism um, on their website. So this is something we need to support them and help them. Um, otherwise, they they will they won't be able to adapt the programmatic elements, the certain elements uh, on their own. They, they just won't work for them. It, it takes a, a, a digital strategy. It's like sending, sending them the best and latest uh, Mercedes-Benz with, with a driver who can't, can't really drive. So, um, 
we try to educate the market. We, we, we focus all the presentations uh, to education and to explain before we, we talk about programmatic why the strategy is, is important and, and then we can move on to specific elements. And that's something we do for the other side of the business as well, so to local publishers. Oftentimes they, are, they feel threatened by, by this new business model. They don't know how to adapt it. Um, it shouldn't be the case. They should just see the opportunity. Yeah, can, I, can I just build on that? I mean, you know, Sasha said it very well. Um, you know, the, the promise of programmatic is that it's user centric. Right? Actually, all the other stuff is just, you know, how we do it. You know, there's a really exciting why we do it. Yeah, right. Which is actually the much more exciting part of everything we're talking about. You know, let's not talk about the technologies. Let's talk about the thing. It's about the fact that we're. With these tools and technologies, we're finally able to create a properly user-centric approach to media. Right? Now, I refuse to believe that that's not interesting or intuitively appealing to clients. Right? But it is an education process. You know? And we have, to, we have to sort of bring ourselves up out of trying to educate our clients necessarily just about the technologies that exist and into what the opportunities that those technologies create are about. You know, and, it's, and, and that means removing the silos of, okay, you've got your digital investment versus your TV investment. You know, removing some of those silos about you've got search versus other things. You know, it's about trying to create more of a holistic approach to planning, which is where the whole change management piece comes in. It's very complicated to get right. Um, and it's an evolution. So. I think it's, that's definitely to the point, and you're, you're going to follow up on that, uh, Shasha, but let me say the following, and I fully agree. Uh, and one of the things that we usually discuss between ourselves and with our partners as well, is what we call the digital advertising paradox, uh, which is essentially to the heart that, of what you just mentioned. I mean, we have access to the most exciting medium available. Uh, it's real time, it's two-way connected, uh, and we're still trading by and large, utilizing, you know, last century techniques and last century approach. Uh, and to sort of follow up on what Attila began as a discussion with, which I think is crucial, and by the other way, uh, Sasa, pick it up and move it uh, towards whatever you know direction you want. Uh, what is the picture of talent in that new era? I mean, who are we looking for, and can we sort of you know educate and train the people that we already have to move to that direction, or do we need to source new talent or both? We need geeks. We need the people who are in their school time are sitting in the last row. We need the ones who. <laughs> the guys, yeah, yeah, up there. No, we really need the ones who are able to understand mathematics, the ones who love analytics, the ones who are able to work with Excel charts, the ones who love to dig into numbers, um, the ones who are able to communicate, but that's not the most important thing. It's the most important thing is that they love analytics. And I think that's the main difference. Um, if, if, you, if, if you're not that successful in what you're doing, you go into advertising. Yeah, and if you're not good in advertising because you can't sell, you go into media. That doesn't work anymore. Yeah, we really need the people who understand the numbers, who can sell the numbers, who can build things upon numbers. Um, I think this is the main skill set. Um, and other focus, a new focus on mathematics, uh, on engineering science. Doesn't need to be computer science, but this is where we're going to. And on a high level, it's yeah, it's the CMO becoming a chief digital officer, um, integrating much more database knowledge. Um, marketing will be much more market research as well than it was before, because now you get so many information out of your media planning, which will be an immediate feedback mechanism possible now to your product development as well, because you have not just real-time buying, you have now real-time market research, and that will change everything. So this is why I'm talking about this holistic view, and if you're as a brand or if you're as an agency want to convince your client to work with this new programmatic marketing approach, you have to think in a transition plan as well to look for the right skill set and to change the people who are currently in charge of it if they can't develop at the same speed as marketing evolves. 
Can, can it be more to disagree with you just a little bit? Just, just a little bit. This is exactly what we need. We need to spice up the discussion, right? It's well, been quite slow and so, quite quiet. All right. So just, just again to to tell you how I see the, the, the staffing and how these how these, these teams need to need to grow and develop. We see a lot of businesses grow from from zero to spending you know millions and millions of dollars per month in in, in programmatic. And yeah, you need to have geeks, as, as Sasha would refer to them more, and people who understand analytics. But most companies have already got those people anyway. I'm not suggesting that. You know, Sasha's wrong. I'm saying that's a question of repurposing probably teams that you've already got. You know, have them delve deeper, try to understand what the depth of information is that they could actually mine down to. But aside of that, I would also then say that where the businesses have grown to that we've seen, where they stall is on the basis that they no longer know how to position this. You know, if you're an agency trading desk, your client are the agencies. So you need to be able to sell to the agencies what you're actually providing to them. Otherwise, you know, you're going to get uh, eaten alive by the networks who do know how to sell this. You know, the, the retargeters, the scale bidders. Um, you're going to run out of opportunities in terms of understanding how to differentiate. If this does go to 50%, 60% market penetration, then how are you going to differentiate your business? Your geeks are not going to be able to tell you how to do that. They're not going to come up with ideas about how you can build, you know, social analytics, um, build on top of the API to, 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 to have custom UIs for every you know, customer that you work with. They're not going to come up with those ideas. They're going to execute those ideas, but they're not going to come up with them. So you've got to still got to remember that the geeks don't know where the business is going to go to. They can interpret where the business is today, or you know where you might be able to find your users, or what segment to build, um, or uh, you know how to how to price or how to value the inventory that you're looking at. But uh, you've got to evolve the business models. So you've got to be able to understand that those people are still critically important. Absolutely, I agree actually. So from, from an agency trading desk point of view, that's exactly um, how we try to build our team. So we do need the geeks to operate these infrastructures and systems and so on and so on. We, but we do need the people to go out and talk to the advertisers, create and devise the strategies, sell and so on and so on. So you need two different teams really and, and that's what I saw when I was in... Absolutely, absolutely not. That's a very, very short-term thinking, totally. You guys, you try to secure your jobs. Yeah? I, I'm, talking, I'm talking about the future. Yeah? I'm not talking about there are geeks and there are people who translate what the geeks are thinking about to the client because the client doesn't understand it. Yeah, short-term, one, two years. But the future will be. There are these tech savvy, let's not talk, call them geeks. Actually, a geek is not a nerd. A geek is someone who is able to work with numbers, who is able to work with statistics, but is able to talk about that as well. Geeks are creative guys. Geeks are not the nerdy guys. They are creative nerds. So, and these are the people we are talking about to have them in the future marketing organization. And what you guys are talking about is something in between. It's to make the next step. Um, but in the future, we don't need these translators. We need the ones executing, and the ones who are working with the numbers. We don't need the in-betweens, and that will be a massive change. So if you don't know about numbers yet, if you hate mathematics, look for a new job, or change it. I actually think there's a bunch of people we haven't even talked about here. Um, uh, I'm not going to disagree or agree with Sasha, because that's too obvious. <laughs> um, uh, I went to, uh, to Ops London um, this year, and it was quite interesting. Last year, there was something like 250 people in the room. This year, there was maybe 60. Um, and, and I think that one, one of the reasons for that is I think that the skill set of ad operations, right, the understanding of how to deploy the technology, um, has become so widely dispersed into agencies, clients, you know, companies like ours, that you know, the whole meaning of ad ops has sort of almost disappeared. But I actually think they're some of the most important people. If I think about our, our company, we've got the analysts, we've got the, you know, the developers, we've got all those guys. If I think about the guys that I really can't do without, right, the guys that I will, have, I will have by my side in even a basic conversation with a client, because when it comes to you know, cookie syncing their CRM data to our data, you know, when it comes to any kind of conversation, the operators, Right, the ad ops guys, the guys who understand how to, how, to, how to actually deploy and manage the technology. You can have a, you know, none of this stuff is baked in, right? It all, it's different every single time. It's different every single time. Not even two of the same organizations, two banks are the same. They all have a different way of doing things. 
And you know, we, as much as we like to, as we and we do like to think of ourselves as a product business, and we deliver products to clients, the, the actual configuration, deployment, and management of those products is completely different every time. You know, so if, if I could double any size, any part of my business tomorrow, it wouldn't be the salespeople, though they're important. Um, it wouldn't be the analysts, though they're important. It wouldn't be the developers. It'd be the ops guys. Take on the subject. Yeah, but <laughs> I'm thinking about this. Yes, what guys said. Yeah. No, <laughs> no. no from, from from my point of view, yes, I, I agree. It should be geeks. Uh, it should be crazy people who who love technology because it's it's all around the technology thing. So so they have to know the maths. But from the other hand, I'm I'm thinking about one thing because uh, you said that we need some people with mathematics and things like that. But we are still around somewhere with automatization. So do you think maybe in next six years uh, we will not need these people, but we will have just the computers who will optimize? I'm not saying that we will replace the human. Uh, being with with machine with 100% of course be, because uh, when you're analyzing the campaign you, you you're optimizing it there's no system which could optimize but we are in 2014 what about 2020 never happened <laughs> no I know that not 100% but maybe we'll not need uh, let's say five developers we will need one developer it, 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 the, as long as clients have different systems and different approaches that'll never happen it'll never happen because the amount of time that you need to spend to get them to really fundamentally make the most of this technology so no, no, is, is, is huge. I disagree. Um, with me or with who? <laughs> that's my job. Um, yeah, you told me. I should just disagree. Yeah. By all means. Yeah, okay. So, no, um, I think, okay, 100%. We're talking about six years. Yeah, we're talking about an industry which was officially started in Europe in something like early 2010 late 29, yeah? So you're talking now about now 2020. And um, data is a technology which is 100% focusing on usability. So we have cruise control, we have forecasting, all the things which is telling you what you should do with your campaign to get your campaign targets. And if I just think about how other technologies evolve, and we're talking about integrated stacks, we're talking about technologies who have an integrated DMP, they have an integrated DSP, they have integrated analytics stack, and they have an integrated ad server, they have integrated dynamic creative optimization, they have integrated um, APIs to Facebook, to Twitter, and, and, and. And these technologies already exist. So I think all these trouble with different technologies won't exist in six years anymore. Um, I'm sure there will be always humans on the back end thinking about it and pushing the right buttons, but it will be much, much fewer than now. And that's what we already see with large agencies or brand, brand trading desk, which already exists, who working for companies, for example, like Ford. Ford, the agency, actually, um, it's Team Detroit, it's a Group M agency, and we had many, 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 many media planners just working on the global or on the North American Ford account. And they are now a handful of media planners and digital anymore because they are working with one integrated platform. Actually, it's data, so sorry for that. But um, it really shows the direction which we are going. Yeah, so there will be, there will be humans, yes, but um, they will focus on more consulting. They will focus on less manual stuff. Well, Firstly, to, again, the, no, no need to apologize about uh, Team Detroit. That's, that's quite all right. I'm sure they'll figure it out sooner or later. <laughs> but uh, with, with, with the greatest respect, um, I'm, I'm impressed that anybody knows where things are going to be in, in 2020. But if you'd asked me, so what's that, that's six years from now. If you'd have asked me in 2008, where would we be in 2014? I mean, like, I don't know. Twitter didn't exist, right? Facebook was around, but it was much smaller. You know, so if anybody can now tell me what Pinterest is going to look like, what um, uh, Foursquare is going to look like in 2020, I'll, I'll be very impressed. So I guess what I'm saying here is there's no way to know, firstly, and let's be honest with ourselves, where this evolves to. The most important thing is us essentially trying to capture how we want to engage consumers, which is what it comes down to. This is an advertising business model. So what that means is if you know what consumer behavior is going to look like in 2020, then you know what this market will look like in 2020. 
you know, will it be? Yeah, right, yeah. I'm going into business with Sasha because he obviously does know. But, um, but yeah, look, I, I, I don't know. How are we going to engage with phones? How are we going to be driving our cars? How are we going to be going on holiday? How are we going to engage with computer games? If you know that, you know what the tech stack needs to look like. If you want to future-proof your business, then you have to understand the markets you want to operate in. You have to understand the features that are relevant to the consumers that you're trying to target. Advertising, after all, is the ability to influence a consumer. So, you know, how do you go about doing that? You understand where they're going to be, what they're going to be doing. And your tech stack, or your, uh, the, the way that you execute campaigns, has to reflect that. We know that you're going to need different people, they're going to do different things. Um, hopefully I'll still have a job, but we'll see. You know, I, I didn't sit on the back row, but uh, you know, maybe halfway. Um, so you know, it's, it's important that, uh, that, that you guys understand exactly what that looks like here. So what I'm saying is, um, Sasha may have an interesting view of the future, but uh, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to politely disagree. And let me, let me try to close the door that I opened an hour ago or something, uh, by saying the, the following, which I, th I think is quite evident from the, from the discussion, and it's, it's more or less the reality that we're all facing. You need diversity, right? I mean, the whole notion of programmatic and the things that are coming ahead cannot be tackled by a single-minded team. Uh, so you cannot view it as a purely technological project. You cannot view it as a purely you know, commercial project. Uh, it needs to have both aspects in place. And to some extent, if I am to sort of translate the numbers, that we saw before. To me, this is part of the complexity that the organizations are facing. Uh, because in a lot of cases, they're trying to approach that in a single-minded mindset. So they're either looking at programmatic as a technological project or purely looking at this as a commercial thing. And, and this doesn't coincide quite well. Uh, so let me stop with diversity and let me try to raise the tides a bit with the following question, which goes a bit like that. I mean, obviously, we've said that we are fortunate or unfortunate, you, you're going to tell me, to have experiences from the US and Western Europe as to you know, how programmatic has been phasing out and expanding and sort of evolving. So I'm not going to look for uh, the Ten Commandments, but give me one or two, thou shalt not something. So what would be your best practices or things that you know, either buyers or sellers should avoid? based on the experience that we have had from Western uh, markets. Yeah, so <laughs> what, what should they avoid? They, from my point of view, they should avoid uh, selling uh, programmatic campaigns without data because it's completely <laughs> doesn't have any sense. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah, makes sense yeah. uh, what should they avoid? Yeah, it's very hard to say from my point of view, yes, because uh, nowadays I'm on this growing market, yes, which is uh, many things are appears and, and uh, what, what is today, week, or a month ago, it was completely different point of view. Yeah? So it's, it's, it's really hard to tell me from from data provider point of view. Okay. Um, yeah, well, it's, it's, a, it's a tough question because it's sort of, there's different answers depending on whose perspective you take it on, like from a client or from a publisher or from an agency. Well, let's, or, let's, you know. let's define the perspective and give no, it. No, no, that's fine. I'll answer the question. Don't worry. I wasn't, I wasn't avoiding it. <laughs> um, I'd agree with the data point, thou shalt not ignore data, but I'd take it one step forward and say, thou shalt not think that your data is the only data. You know, too often we still hear um, uh, uh, clients and publishers coming to us saying, you know, if, if you don't want to use our data, you can't use the data at all. Right? So it's a sort of an, it's our data or your data, not your, our data and your data, which I think is a, uh, is, is, a, is very short-term thinking, very short-term thinking. You know, I think you know, clients' data is much more powerful when it's connected to media data. I don't have client data, they don't have media data. So, you know, we all have a role to play. And data is fundamentally what drives this stuff, right? It really is fundamentally what drives this stuff, which is why we've invested in, you know, our data management platform and we haven't invested in the pipes that are connected to the media because we don't need those. You know, we're very happy with, with AppNexus on that. Um, you know, uh, the other thing I would say is if you're a client, and I'm on, I have to be careful what I say here, but I'm sort of slightly thin ice, but um, you know, thou should, should be very careful, I won't say thou should not, thou should be very careful before you think you can do this all yourself. Um, and I, th I, 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 I read a great quote yesterday, um, I, I won't attribute it to anyone, but it was um, just because you can exercise wearing spandex, it doesn't mean you should. 
which I thought was quite interesting. You know, some people probably can and should exercise in spandex, but, not, but most people probably shouldn't. You know, the reality is that this is an incredibly complicated ecosystem. To Nigel's point, you know, we have no clue where this is going in 10 years' time, five years' time, even two years' time. You know, two years ago, none of the stuff we're talking about was even being thought about, really. Right? That's going to except be my, for, except except be my last thing. question, by the way. Except for in Sasha's organization, where they were thinking about this stuff five years ago. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it changes all the time, you know? And so if you, if, as a client who isn't, let's say, already super literate in the technology space, you know, like, say, in Amazon, let's say, right? But if you're doing something which isn't so you know, deeply in the, in, in the tech space. If you think you, can, you, you want to build something like this, you know, be very, very careful, right? Because this does not replace your agency. It is, it is another way of buying media. It's another way of engaging with media. It's an, another way of engaging with audiences. But it's very complex, you know? And the role of the agency is different. I agree with Sasha in this space. It is more, more consultative. It is more about navigating those opportunities and creating the, 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 the products as well. Um, but it doesn't go away. Well, so I can't obviously use all the same points that Casper's just mentioned, because that would just be boring, right? So I've got to think of something else. But uh, obviously, obviously, I agree with all of that. Um, I'm going to pick out two things then that, that we haven't covered. The first one would be, I have to start with thou shalt not, just to make it even more dramatic. Um, ignore mobile. That's probably the biggest crime that we're seeing outside of, well, in the markets that I've been working in for the last couple of years. Um, people are just assuming something's going to happen, and all of a sudden they're going to understand mobile, some sort of... Fantastic data is going to show up. Some sort of brilliant cross-platform technology is going to appear, and everybody gets it. Statistical analysis is all of a sudden going to solve everybody's problems. And there's a chance that all of those things will happen. Um, but uh, don't ignore mobile. If you do, and again, we can all be very frank, even though I'm being filmed, Facebook and Google are going to completely run away with it, and mobile is the future of media, pretty much. Once the infrastructure in most markets gets to a point where mobile can be consumed correctly, like you've got in France, wonderful broadband infrastructure. Video consumption in France is huge. It's absolutely huge, which then in turn drives brand-led advertising, which then in turn drives the kind of people they want to hire. They don't want quants. People in the UK want quants. So again, bringing it back to my point, don't ignore mobile. It, it, it feeds so many different conversations and considerations that you need to take into account. That would be the first one. The second one, which I think is probably an iteration of that, is don't silo. If you work in a big business now, which already has a display part, maybe you come from print, maybe you work for a big agency, maybe you're in TV, don't silo programmatic. Don't develop specialists and then wheel them out when you're in a pitch. Oh, here's our, here's our programmatic specialist. Don't just train two salespeople and send those guys to agencies and say, well, they're going to sell the programmatic campaign because you're going to have all kinds of business uh, conflicts. As time moves forward, you're going to have friction amongst people. You're going to silo knowledge. And it, like it or not, virtually everything will be transacted in this way or executed in this way. But I don't believe it will be negotiated in this way. I don't believe that it will be planned in this way. So don't silo programmatic. Well, to be the, not the real last, but to be the second last in a row is always a bit difficult. I don't want to repeat you guys, but I sign in everything you're saying, um, except third party data. Um, I think third-party data, so all these data which doesn't belong to the advertiser, I think it's not that crucial for programmatic marketing in the beginning if you start with it. But it's important that as an advertiser, you really pixel your page, that you are able to collect first-party data, data you own, and then optimize holistic, means not silo, through mobile, through video, through social, through display based on all the first party data you have. So coming to the first, I wouldn't say mistake, but something you shouldn't do. Figure out real KPIs for your campaign so you, that you don't end up just optimizing through cost per click. Cost per click is a very, very easy KPI. Cost per click is the most used KPI currently in CEE. And whenever you want to start with programmatic, I can understand that you start with cost per click, but think deeper. Pixel your page, define a, CP, um, a CPX target which is behind cost per click, because the ones who are clicking 
are not the ones who are buying. And on the other hand, there are so many dodgy technologies out there who are doing clicks and you're paying for it. So I think a very, very simple thing is if you're currently buying on cost per click, try to figure out another KPI which is based on pixels on the advertiser side. Yeah, I think it's uh, totally right. So we move away from, from cost per click and, and put something else in, in, in the heart of your um, digital strategy because CP, the cost per click is, is oftentimes misleading, um, especially for example if you don't have anything really to say on, on your website. Um, I, I totally agree with all of you actually, so um, embrace third-party data, um, but also be ready to pay whatever it's really worth. So don't stick with a cheap CPM campaign, uh, be ready to uh, bid higher and, and pay more if that's what it takes to buy, buy the data, because um, at the end of the day it's going to pay out for you. Um, and also, I, I, I think it would uh, summarize all these points to think uh, holistically and think uh, as a strategy and not just use programmatic uh, for the sake of using programmatic and, and as a tactical solution to buy media, but as a, as a essential element of your digital strategy because it can be so much more than just buying um, in a programmatic way. Okay, so, I mean, we've been spending the good part of the last hour discussing a bit of a a more esoteric approach to, to programmatic, right? We've been peeking under the, the hood or looking behind the curtain. Uh, but let's sort of end the panel with a, a forward looking bit. I was gonna ask for a five or 10 year prediction, but you pretty much ruined that for me uh, <laughs> a bit back. So let's, let's tie down the, the future looking window uh, to something like what's the rest of 2014 and 2015 is looking like for you and your organizations globally and on the region? And what would be the opportunities that you would suggest to somebody from the region, either a buyer or a seller, who would come to you, and potentially they will, after the panel, and ask you, you know, what's in it for me? Uh, what am I gonna do 2015, 2015? All right, let, let, let me go first on this one. Um, so let, let me rephrase the question just very slightly and say, what's the next big thing? Yeah. Let's put it that way, right? Okay. So uh, my view on that is I, I hope there isn't a next big thing for a while, right? Um, you know, we have at our disposal now in this industry so many new tools and so many new opportunities, um, so many new ways of engaging with audiences and reaching uh, and, and, and achieving our, our, our clients' um, uh, performance um, uh, metrics or whatever, whatever, whatever the metric may be. And I completely agree about all the new metrics, by the way, is fundamentally important. We have all those tools now, right? We don't, we actually, you know, the big what's next is putting them together properly, right? Actually taking a breath for a minute, standing back from the whole thing and putting them together properly rather than thinking, okay, bloody hell, what's the next big thing? Quick, let's rush off to something else again and, and leave all the stuff we have behind. You know, we have the tools right now at our disposal to fundamentally change the way we do media. Right? And that's incredibly exciting. And so for me, the next big thing is nothing. It's actually putting that stuff together properly. So what's the next actual thing for you as an organization? Let's focus on the region. So what's coming in 2014, okay, 2015 sure. so, yeah. for this specific region of the world? Fine, absolutely. So for, specifically for us, um, you know, we've launched a business here now. Um, we've got uh, we've got our, our currently sort of second generation DMP, which is which is in place here in in in, in Romania and in many other markets in in the region as well, uh, particularly Poland and Czech Republic. Um, you know, we're looking at launching other markets over the next uh, over the rest of the year. Um, we always have teams on the ground as well, just to, just like to, just like you. So for us, it's you know obviously leveraging WPP and Group M's presence in those markets to build teams, which is great because it gives us a, a, a sort of a a, a talent pool to tap into, which is already, and who have a very good understanding of all the local market dynamics. So that's, a, that's an advantage we, we have, definitely. Um, the big thing for us across the region this year is the launch of our new, new, gen, new sort of third generation DMP. Well, it's called Turbine. Um, I'm probably not allowed to talk about it because it's being, uh, but it'll, be, it'll be launched in the next couple of days. You'll see some press activity around it. Um, and, um, you know, it's a very exciting project for us. 
I'm still thinking about the last question about third-party data, first-party data. I didn't want to <laughs> stop your discussion, but uh, yeah, sometimes, uh, not sometimes, I agree with you that don't start with third-party data, but uh, when I said that, okay, let's start to my, uh, what, what should I recommend? Use data, yeah? So when I said use third-party data, in default it is, if you have your own data, of course, don't spend stupid money on, on, on third-party data, just try to use it, but in most of the cases you don't have enough data, yeah? you don't have uh, enough data, so you need this third-party data. But, but from the other hand, uh, as many data points you have, the better profiles you can create and the better campaign will perform, so totally don't use at the first stage third-party data. I do not agree in 100% in that, yes, because we can uh, we can really it's it's case of KPI of the campaign, of course. Yes. Yeah? So so if we can create very nice profile, very detailed profile, based on many sources, this campaign would be very very successful. So yeah. So that's my point of view. I wanted to to, to, to say that because I will not sleep tonight. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, and what to do next? Yes. What 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 are our plans? In general, uh, I think in the whole C. So this is still education. Yes, I think that that market needs to to be educated. Yes, I think this is our together job. Uh, that that that's not uh, not to fight on the market, but first of all, let's educate. Let's show them what they can do. Yes. So I can learn the market. Uh, what is the data? What are prediction data? What are first, second party data? How to create good profile? How to analyze it and and things like that. Yes. So. For Romanian markets, we already have here data points, so it's it's easier for us. So, so for Romanian markets nowadays, we can provide this data to 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 any SSP, DSP, any any platform. Yeah. So, so this is uh, this is the, the the next steps for 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 me. Yes, but for the other markets, it's still education, telling what are we doing, what for are we doing that, and why we are doing it. Thank you. So. The question was, was two things, right? What, what are we doing? Yeah. And then what do, we, what do we think is important here? That was the idea, at least. I'll try not to rephrase the question and <laughs> answer something completely different. Um, so what are we doing? The focus for us is... <laughs> sorry. Just trying to remember what the question was. Really. These, are getting, these answers are getting quite long. So the, the, the most important thing for us is, is, I would say, almost entirely mobile. Um, we've got, well, extremely mature, um, sorry, mature display business now. Um, the stats I was giving you earlier um, are growing exponentially. We're seeing 120, 130 billion display ad impressions per day. You know, the amount of cookies that we sync, the amount of user profiles that we see, the amount of transaction and trading concepts you know, that we're fortunate enough to be a part of um, are super exciting, but frankly they mean nothing if they don't translate into mobile and if they don't translate quite quickly. Um, we don't understand what the gaps to that are. Data is, is, a big, is a big problem. Obviously, availability of data in mobile is a big problem. But we've got ways of delivering um, a, a very strong understanding of who is who and how to map things cross-channel and cross-platform based on our experiences in display. So that's a big, big area of focus for us as a business, um, if not the area of focus. Uh, the second, which is related to the region, um, is a strong area of focus for me personally and, and the teams that I work with in Europe is understanding the intersection between what we would call, let's say, trading techniques or trading marketplaces like performance, auction, um, direct, uh, deals, all of which I think are, are extremely different. I'm going to talk tomorrow about that in, in the keynote session that we have. Um, but where do they intersect with regional marketplaces? Like, What does that mean in France? What does that mean in, uh, in Romania? What is that going to mean in, in Germany, in Turkey? They're all completely different. They want totally different things. They want to understand in one market, deals could go exponentially high, and in another market, auction doesn't even get off the ground. Germany is a great example of that. They, they don't really want the same things as, as, as the people in the UK. So where do they intersect? Um, and, and trying to drive the most amount of liquidity, support, and, and obviously growth for, for the customers that we work with. Go first, and then you do the last word. I can see. You. Okay, <laughs> agree. So, um, in terms of uh, looking into the future, which personally I, I don't really like to do that either. Um, so, probably branding, uh, budget from branding campaigns will start coming into digital and into programmatic uh, in particular. And um, uh, what, what we need to do that is is the use of uh, data, uh, quality data, and and uh, 
public deals and private market places and reserve buys and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So this kind of intersection is, uh, is, is really a fascinating thing. Um, also mobile is definitely something uh, we do um, pay attention to. And um, for us as a, as a business uh, in the sea region, so just, uh, just arrived here actually in, earlier in March, so, um, so we are still um, gaining pace and established business. Um, in terms of that, um, we're going to do a lot of education um, to, to our clients who will try to explain my programmatic matters and how they can, uh, uh, how they can use it uh, properly, um, as well as extend, extend our proposition with, with some really, really fascinating and interesting uh, technology and, and solutions. So, growing the team as well. Actually, I want to look into the future. I love it. Um, just, just to tell you something about my background. Since 1995, I'm founding companies, and I founded so far four companies in the advertising and advertising technology industry. And um, all of them was because looking into the future. Three of them were quite successful. So I think I'm allowed to. Look, I, I think I'm allowed to look into the future. So um, how, how does the future look like? Um, I just, I just want to talk about the region. I think that in this region. In the future, which means one or two years, um, large agency and more and more so-called small private trading desks will work on platforms, programmatic marketing platforms, in charge of brand advertisers, giving them an holistic view of all the digital and non-digital digi um, media investments as well. So this is how I see the future. A new kind of agencies growing up in this region, let's call them private trading desks, and on the other hand, trading desks of the large agencies like Xaxis, like Cadreon, being more and more successful in the region as well. Um, that's how the media landscape will change in the next couple of 24 months. What we are doing, um, we are doing it much, much easier for these kind of new companies to work holistic through one platform, through all the digital landscape. To make it easier for um, media planners or ad operation managers working on this machine to um, reach all current channels so that the brand advertiser get a non-siloed, holistic view on all his digi um, digital investment and as well about the target group he reached, all the kind of analytics back and so on. Um, so what we are doing, doing it much, much easier to work on this kind of platforms and working with regional media suppliers and actually what Nigel is saying, AppNexus is doing a fabulous job in really finding excellent regional media sources, which is very, very difficult all over the world. You really have to regionalize your platform that you are able to work with regional um, um, suppliers and publishers. So, and it's all about to figure out how is the, in that case, the Romanian market different, for example, to the Polish market. And there are differences, and how can we reflect that in the platform? So where do you focus on compared to where you focus on in Poland? Excellent. And I think this pretty much concludes today's session. Uh, as a last comment on my end, I think we're definitely on a fast-paced evolutionary path in the region. Uh, the fact that we have this panel today, uh, the fact that we have an entire session at stage two, uh, we have a keynote session tomorrow at stage one, in an additional workshop uh, compared to last year's IC Fest, which had a couple of speeches at most, uh, I think speaks volumes about how the programmatic is evolving uh, throughout the region. I'd like to thank you all uh, for your insights, for your uh, knowledge that you shared with us. And feel free to get back uh, to us if you want to discuss things in more detail. As we discussed in length here, this is a complex matter. So, you know, education is part of the game, training is part of the game, discussions are definitely part of the game. Thank you all, and thanks to all of our panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much.